Good evening and a very warm welcome to Clare College for this, the second in our series of 50, 50th anniversary lectures, uh, marking half a century of co-education here at Clare. Our speaker this evening, um, Professor Trish Greenhalge, um, is, as the slide says, an alumna of this college where she studied from 1977 to 1980. Now she is the Professor of Primary Care Health Sciences and a Fellow of Green Templeton College at the University of Oxford. She studied medical, social and political sciences at Cambridge and clinical medicine at Oxford before training first as a diabetologist and later as an academic general practitioner. And this is, I find, amazing. She has a doctorate in diabetes care and an MBA in higher education management and leads a programme of research at the interface between the social sciences and medicine, working across primary and secondary care. She has brought this interdisciplinary perspective to bear on the research response to the COVID-19 pandemic, looking at diverse themes, including the clinical assessment of the deteriorating patient by phone and video, the science and anthropology of face coverings, and policy decision-making in conditions of uncertainty. She is a member of Independent SAGE, an interdisciplinary academic team established to provide independent advice on the pandemic direct to the lay public. Trish is the author of over 400 peer-reviewed publications and 16 textbooks. She was awarded an OBE for Services to Medicine in 2001 and made a Fellow of the UK Academy of Medical Sciences in 2014. She is also a Fellow of the UK Royal College of Physicians, the Royal College of General Practitioners, the Faculty of Informatics and the Faculty of Public Health. In 2021, she was elected to the Fellowship of the United States National Academy of Medicine for, I quote, major contributions to the study of innovation and knowledge translation and work to raise the profile of qualitative social sciences. We are absolutely delighted to have Trish give her lecture this evening. Trish, over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Toby. Thank you, Loretta, for inviting me. Thank you, Clare College. I'm, I'm honoured and delighted to share in your 50th anniversary celebrations of being co-ed. I haven't heard that term in a very long time. Um, on the 21st of October this year, Professor Polly O'Hanlon kicked off this lecture, the lecture series by describing her experiences when she arrived at Clare in 1972, five years before me. Apparently, the original women's bedrooms were fitted with full-length mirrors um, and the college also kindly kitted out a sewing room for them. Um, I think that the, the, um, when, when I arrived in 77, both these vanity mirrors and the sewing room had disappeared, or if they hadn't, there wasn't much else going on. There was so much else going on that I failed to notice them. But um, as a woman who was born in the 1950s, Early enough to experience Cambridge while it was still wrestling with its gender issues, I have a few stories of my own to share. So first, a bit of background. I was a working class kid from an unglamorous home. Here's the Northern Council estate where my family lived uh, when I was born. I was the only girl of four kids and even at a tender age I didn't take kindly to being dressed in a frock. Now, <laughs> my mum did her best. She told me if I learnt to be more ladylike, um, I might one day end up married to Prince Andrew, who was about my age. <laughs> Even at the age of four, I had other plans. <laughs> and unbeknown to me at the time, the 1960s were a pivotal decade for working class kids who'd set their sights on a university education. In 1963, 
Lord Lionel Robbins published his far-reaching report recommending that university places should be greatly expanded and made available to, I quote, all who were qualified for them by ability and attainment. So when I was born in 1959, only 3% of young people attended university, but by the time I applied to Clare in 1976, that figure had increased fivefold, and those of us on low parental incomes got full state support. It was a good time to be young, poor, and academically ambitious. Now, this lecture is partly about technologies, and here's one from the 1960s, the Honeywell 316, the kitchen computer. It was a 16-byte computer with a built-in chopping board. It was offered for sale in 1969 for 10,000 US dollars. This is true. It was about 60,000 pounds in today's prices. So here's the marketing spiel, which was clearly directed at the man of the house. If only she can cook as well as Honeywell can compute. Her souffles are supreme. Her meal planning, a challenge. She's what the Honeywell people had in mind when they devised our kitchen computer. She'll learn to program it with a cross-reference to her favorite recipes, and then by simply pushing a few buttons, obtain a complete menu organized around the entree. The programming course on which the wife was to be sent took two weeks. If it's not obvious why I'm including this example, it's to illustrate what's known as the socio-technical perspective. The idea that science and technology don't stand apart from culture and society. Rather, both science and technologies are themselves cultural products. They're historically path dependent. They may ossify and reproduce our cultural assumptions and stereotypes, often without us realizing it at the time. So hold that thought. I'm going to come back to it shortly. Now, in 1972, three years after Honeywell's epic kitchen computer fail, while Claire was welcoming its first women students, I was still an awkward 13-year-old, living with my family of six in a cramped flat above Joe Thompson's garage and attending Folkestone Grammar School for Girls. <coughs> I'd discovered my sport, swimming, but the town only had an outdoor pool, which was bracing in the autumn and closed in the winter. My school hadn't yet sent any pupil to Oxford or Cambridge, but Mary Glover, a couple of years ahead of me, changed that when she made it to Clare. I think she studied philosophy, and word came back to the school that this was an experience worth striving for. Also in 1972, men and their gadgets were in the ascendant. As Clare's, Clare's first women matriculated, Chuck Berry sat at number one with my ding -ling. Alan Alcorn had just released the world's first video game, Pong. Thanks to Thomas Whitney, the world's first scientific calculator had overnight rendered the slide rule obsolete. In healthcare, Godfrey Hounsfield had just produced the world's first commercial CT scanner, though it would be over a decade before such innovations were introduced in the NHS. Mainframe computers were just beginning to take up space in the accounts departments of hospitals. So around this time, the first of many NHS chief executives must have made a claim he would later regret, that the latest technology would inevitably increase efficiency and save money. In 1976, Claire's first women had already graduated. I was called for interview. I took the train, walked along the river watching the boats, and discovered that the city had an indoor swimming pool. I had my breath taken away on the backs by what I still believe is the most beautiful view of any educational establishment in the entire world. As 17-year-old me crossed the bridge from Memorial Court to Old Court, I hoped I wouldn't get what we then called a male chauvinist pig of an interviewer. I struck lucky. My interviewers, with a legendary Gordon Wright and a young postdoc in jeans and a lumberjack shirt called Tim Hunt. Tim went on to share the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine in 2001. This series is not about men's achievements, but I want to use this platform to thank Tim for everything he's done in his long and distinguished career to support women's advancement in science. 
1977, I arrived to study medicine here at Clare, five years after Polly's cohort had to explain that they didn't sew, I was blazing my own trail by missing lectures for sport and breaking as many rules as possible. I kept an illegal motorcycle with my name branded on the tank. I got a job working for the forerunner of chauffeur punt and I had my own way of navigating the top floor of Memorial Court by working my way round the outside of the building hanging from the roof. Soon after I started at Clare, I answered an advertisement for research subjects. Colin Blakemore's Visual Physiology Lab were researching amblyopia, or lazy eye. The team did some studies on my lazy eye, but I soon got caught up in the action and became a co-researcher. Here is my first academic paper. Colin recently died, and I had this exchange on Twitter with his daughters. If only scientific internships were as easy to arrange now as they were then. Now in 1979, I had a career changing experience when I did a year of social and political sciences before returning to medicine. It included the newly established women's studies course, which some of us spelt W-I-M-M-I-N. The social scientists among you will know that 1979 is an incredible time for social science at Cambridge. Here are some of the core texts that we were given to read. Sheila Robotham and Donna, Dorothy Dinnerstein analysed women's oppression through historical and psychoanalytic lenses, respectively. Mary Douglas recast dirt as matter out of place and showed how the sacred, the clean and the unclean vary widely across cultures, a key anthropological theory which I later applied myself to critique over assiduous hand sanitising as a ritual of purification during the pandemic, but that is a subject for another day. My research on health technologies was more directly influenced by three books by men. In 1979, Anthony Giddens, who was my tutor at the time, was putting together the brilliant sociological grand theory, which he later called structuration theory, but which at the time he was calling new rules of sociological method. He invited us to consider social structures and human agency as dynamically evolving and recursively linked. What on earth does that mean? Well, in other words, the various structures of society influence but do not determine what people do. And conversely, what people do both reproduces social structures and changes them over time. And I'll come back to structuration theory in a bit. Paul Willis's book, Learning to Labour, published in 1978, was a gripping ethnography of the last year of grammar school and the first six months in the workplace for a group of working class boys in a deprived northern town. Willis showed how the social structure of class was enacted and reproduced by the boys' bad behaviour, which was oriented to subverting the school's middle class academic ethos, generating a strong sense of group identity, but effectively ensuring that they left school without the qualifications they needed to get middle class jobs. That book resonated strongly with my own background and rebellious streak. And we read a lot of Habermas, who was introducing a range of ideas which reflected a wider movement in the social sciences known as critical theory. Language I was learning does hidden work. By the end of my year of SPS, I had a lot to learn, but already I was enthusiastic about qualitative methods, especially the power of ethnographic studies in the real world. And I was reluctant to look at data without theory. So the rest of this lecture is about what happened when I took my newfound identity as a social scientist back into medicine. And in particular, when I started studying medical technologies through this lens. Okay, so let's fast forward to, 19, uh, to 2022. We're living in a world of ubiquitous technologies. Most of us are naked without our smartphones. Technologies sometimes make us sick, but health technologies of various kinds can help diagnose us, monitor us, treat us, store and share our health data, connect us to our clinicians or our loved ones, prompt us to take our medication or complete our daily 10,000 steps, 
guide our doctors to manage our illness in evidence-based ways, enable medical research to be conducted on us and much more. I'm not going to gallop you through an eclectic timeline of technologies introduced in the healthcare sector over the last half century. Rather, I want to talk about how technologies in healthcare have been theorised. In particular, I want to show how the work of scholars, many but by no means all of them women, um, who've drawn on feminist theories and the critical social sciences more generally, have built an interdisciplinary field of scholarship that explicitly decenters technologies in favour of a focus on such things as socio-technical systems and the technology-assisted lived body. But first, let me introduce you to the world of medicine in which I trained and worked as an NHS doctor between 1983 and 2020. Also worked as an academic researcher and I had a particular interest in technological innovation and the way that innovation policy is made. Now, some years ago, I managed to get the medical mindset and the technology policy mindset onto one PowerPoint slide. Here it is. Whatever the specific problem that has been defined as needing a solution, the general line of argument is that the old system is one or more of inconsistent, error-prone, fragmented, unaccountable, inefficient, doctor-centered, and reactive. And the hoped for future system will be evidence-based, safe, connected, accountable, efficient, patient-centered and proactive. There's an urgent need, says the policymaker, to move from a Dickensian past to a utopian future by three mechanisms. Modernizing, that is introducing new things, informating, that is making information available, and integrating, that is making different systems talk to each other. The latest IT policy document tells us precisely which technology is going to save us this time round. Now, I made that slide in 2001, I've been showing it for more than 20 years, and it stood the test of time. <laughs> to put it a different way, and borrowing a title from a presentation I once watched at a Sociology of Science conference, technology is the superhero. Is there anything it can't do? The problem with this approach is it's overly technology-centred and it's what sociologists call deterministic. Those of you who've been involved in implementing top-down technology projects in the workplace will recognise the discourse and perhaps share the cynicism. That cynicism doesn't mean that technologies are bad or that they're never going to work, but it does mean we need to look much more closely at the human input that needs to happen to design them better and make them work effectively. Now, one book that I should have read in my year of SPS but didn't was Bruno Latour and Steve Woolgar's Laboratory Life. They originally subtitled this book The Social Construction of Scientific Facts, but in later editions they changed it to just The Construction of Scientific Facts, and that reflected a shift in science and technology studies in the 1980s and 90s from the interpretive, that is, how people gain knowledge by interpreting the world, to the performative, that is, how people produce knowledge by acting in the world. Bruno Latour, who died just last month, is famous for many things, but most relevant to this lecture is his work on actor network theory. The idea that both humans and technologies can be thought of as nodes or actors in a dynamically evolving and often inherently unstable network of relations. It takes work to construct and maintain these networks. Networks can be stabilised to some extent through standards and diagrams and other artefacts. Various phenomena, intended, unintended, useful and harmful, may be generated by the network. For example, if we're talking about the use of technologies to support what's, going, uh, what's known as ageing in place for older people, that is, equipping them and their homes with smart technologies, uh, we need to take account of the people, the material infrastructure, the regulatory standards, and above all, the relationships needed to make those technologies work. Now, I loved actor network theory. It was 
edgy, it was insouciant, it was disruptive. It celebrated technologies, but it didn't put them on a pedestal. It acknowledged uncertainty. It refused to chase after some unattainable, generalizable truth about technology. It embraced real-world messiness rather than trying to control for it. It thumbed its nose at the medical researchers who thought they could nail the role of technologies in healthcare by doing randomized controlled trials in which half the patients got the technology and half got so-called usual care. Now, let's get to the women. All these scholars, one American and three Dutch, draw on actor network theory without usually formally aligning themselves with it. Their take on technology is sometimes described as post-actor network theory, whatever. Let's talk about their ideas. Philosopher Anne-Marie Moll took forward the notion of performativity. We don't diagnose and treat diseases that are already out there. Rather, we bring diseases into being by the actions we take in relation to them. Technologies and the networks of relationships we build around them are part of that performance. They shape the multiple ways in which diseases come into being. An example is how diagnostic technologies and their embedding in the business as usual of healthcare have helped extend traditional di diseases like diabetes to pre-diseases like impaired glucose tolerance, also known as pre-diabetes. Feminist sociologist Susan Lee Starr, whose many achievements include setting up the Society for People Interested in the Study of Boring Things, encouraged us to examine the things such as servers, wires, brick walls, classification schemes, and operational manuals, which make up the infrastructure and standards that technologies need to run on. Boring things are by definition backgrounded and taken for granted. They typically become visible only when they break down. You can produce as many dingalings and other new shiny things as you like, but if you overlook the infrastructure and standards, they'll be as useful as a Christmas toy whose batteries have run down. Now, infrastructure, said Susan Lee Starr, grows in a patchworked and path-dependent way. It needs a great deal of hidden work, often from low-paid women, to keep it running smoothly. One fascinating feature of infrastructure is its different time course. It progresses and regresses over decades, not months or years, a phenomenon that some sociologists uh, describe in French as the longue durée. Research grants, of course, last two to five years, and they're more suited for studying innovations than the legacy infrastructure that those innovations have to run on. Jeanette Poles, whose work might be described as post-feminist as well as post-actor network theorist, challenged us to reject the gendered and polarized dualism that depicts cold care, that is rational, technical, detached, and treating the patient as the object of care on the one hand, uh, versus warm care, that is human, relational, ethical, and emphasizing the patient as subject on the other hand. In reality, said Jeanette Poles, care is both warm and cold and hence embodies a potentially productive tension. As the title of her book suggests, if technologies are designed and used creatively and with attention to the unique and situated needs of the individual, they can bring people closer and enable care. We don't have to choose between a bygone golden era when we connected with our patients directly and a modern era when technology gets in the way of good care. In December 2020, I said goodbye to my own dying mother via a video connection on my smartphone. In the pre-vaccine phase of the pandemic, it was that or nothing. And finally, Nelly Udshorn, who's taken forward Steve Woolgar's astute observation that technologies configure the user. As we saw in that comical story of the Honeywell kitchen computer that nobody wanted to buy, the designers of technologies either consciously or unconsciously build into their products assumptions about who will use them and how. Uchon was an early champion of co-design, 
designing technologies with rather than for their intended users. Chrysanthi Papuzzi from my own team has emphasized how this co-design process needs to focus broadly on the technology and the tasks, processes and relationships that make up the network of care. As she puts it, we need to put the social back into socio-technical. Well, I said I loved actor network theory, and I still love many aspects of it, but I didn't like how it drew too many parallels between humans and technologies. We might all be actors in the network, but we're different kinds of actors. When we're talking about the practices of health professionals and the suffering of sick patients, we need a sophisticated and ethically grounded theory of human experience and action that doesn't double as a theory of how technologies sense or function. In the early 2000s, I realized I was never going to be a card-carrying actor network theorist. What I wanted to do was bring a technology dimension to structuration theory. I started to work with Rob Stones, a sociologist from the University of Essex, who'd spent much of his professional career extending Anthony Giddens's original work. But at that time, neither Giddens nor Stones had said much about technologies. Well, one man had, Steve Barney. In the early 1980s, he'd used structuration theory to study the introduction of CT scanners into two American hospitals. At that time, I myself was pursuing a short and undistinguished career in brain surgery. So I was trying to get my head around these newfangled CT scans for a very different reason. <coughs> Barney called technologies like CT scanners an occasion for structuring. Let me explain what that means. So here's a schematic diagram of structuration theory with added technology. And we start over there, and this is a little timeline, the x-axis, if you like. The red line at the top depicts social structures. Broadly, what society sees as correct, reasonable, affordable, legal, and so on. The blue line at the bottom depicts human agency, what people actually do. The lines are linked through what we might call scripts, the mental models that we have of particular social acts. Social acts can be anything from getting married to going shopping, of course. A medical example is imaging a patient. Someone goes to the doctor and the doctor thinks, I need to take a picture of part of you. The green icons represent technological innovation. As new imaging technologies are introduced, the social practice of imaging a patient shifts from sending them for an X-ray to sending them for a CT scan and then an MRI scan and so on. That much is surely obvious, but stay with me. You can see here that interpreting a standard X-ray of the head is dead easy compared to interpreting a CT scan of the head. As those of us who were aspiring brain surgeons in the early 1980s discovered, the CT scanner takes multiple sli slices through the patient and generates numbers and angles and all sorts of stuff that you were not taught about at medical school. What do you do? Do you go on a course yourself or do you ask the x-ray technician who seems to know about these things if you can pick their brain? That depends uh, where you are. Here's what Steve Barley found. So he's got these two hospitals. In hospital A, the script for imaging a patient unfolded in a way that preserved the existing social and hierarchical relations between doctors and technicians. The doctor ordered the scan, the technician did the procedure, and the doctor interpreted the pictures. But in hospital B, the introduction of the CT scanner created an occasion for structuring. Over a period of a few months, the technicians started to help the doctors interpret the scans, and the doctors accepted that help. This may not sound much, but doctors are hierarchical animals, and this was a minor revolution in the social relations of the hospital. The CT scanner didn't determine this change in relations, but it did create the opportunity. Now, 
When I discovered Barley's work in the early 2000s, I initially thought I could apply his ideas directly to the research I was doing on computerised medical records. But I quickly discovered that what worked for CT scanners, which get replaced about every five years, didn't do so well for software, since software is continually evolving. So you were getting these continuous occasions for structuring every time you got told to download the latest version of the software. So, at this point, I started working with Rob Stones, um, and now we've kind of roughed it up a bit. And you can start over there a long time ago, and you get down to the bottom right here, uh, which is the present day. So we've still got the time axis. Um, so together, we developed what we call Technology Enhanced Structuration Theory, or TEST. Uh, we kept the red timeline of evolving social structures, we kept the blue timeline of evolving human agency, and then we added a third timeline, the green one, of evolving technologies. And we roughed it all up so that it looked non-linear, since they don't all evolve at the same pace. And Rob Stones had already got a, a lot of non-linearity into those diagrams of structuration theory. He'd, he'd already roughed those up, but when we added the, the, the third strand of technology, and we said that at any point in time you can study a social situation, ask questions about the people, the technologies and the external social structures that are influencing but not determining what's unfolding. So these structures, the human agents and the technologies are all historically and culturally situated and they need to be studied empirically using in-depth techniques in the real world such as ethnography. Departing from actor network theory, we theorise the human actor as a thinking, feeling person and the technological actor as an inanimate material thing that inscribes human values and can be programmed to have a limited form of agency. Both are actors in a dynamically evolving network, but only the former has true capacity for moral reasoning. Alan Turing, I hear you. All this may change in the future. I wanted to show you one snippet of data which came from a study a few years ago of nationally accessible electronic patient records in the NHS. And this was actually started with Tony Blair saying if someone gets sick in Birmingham, um, but they live in Bradford, we need the doctor looking after them to be able to hit the button and up would pop the patient's medical records from anywhere uh, in the NHS. And of course, this was particularly useful for uh, people like district nurses who were traveling from house to house. They could just all get on to some kind of rugged laptop and look up the patient's records. So this quote is from a district nurse manager explaining why, even though these records have been introduced across the country at a cost literally of hundreds of millions of pounds, absolutely nobody was using them. Um, not, uh, nobody in, in district nursing service anyway. So the software had been designed to have something called a legitimate relationship screen, a question about whether the person who was asking to see the patient's record had a legitimate reason for doing so. In other words, social structures, professional codes of practice, legislation about access to personal data, social expectations about the privacy of the clinical encounter had been built into the software. Now, Here's a picture of that legitimate relationship screen. Nurses were motivated to do a good job, and in particular, they were very keen not to breach any standards of professional excellence. Their training on how to use this technology had included what they perceived to be a warning not to screw up on the legitimate relationship. The material features of this screen, you can see it, it has a stop command and an are you sure question, effectively functioned as a no entry sign, with literally nobody using these records. Of course the district nurse had a legitimate relationship with the patient, that was why she was attempting to see the record. But the technology was originally designed to ward off illegitimate access attempts rather than enable legitimate ones. So I've given you this brief example to illustrate a more general point that the single biggest reason why technology projects in the NHS fail, and many if not most do, is that either health professionals or patients refuse to use the technology. As in the example of the district nurses, the commonest reason for 
clinicians not using technologies is they have concerns about the professional ethics of doing so. And that's why we had to develop a theory that, that was much more able to develop a, 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 um, embrace human ethics and, and, and what humans feel is ethical behaviour. Now, in recent years, my team have been looking at alternatives to traditional face-to-face -face consultations in healthcare using various kinds of remote technologies. Uh, and these pictures illustrate some of the options. The little girl in the top left has epilepsy. She's work wearing a Fitbit type sensor which will pick up seizures even when the child and her parents are unaware of them. But the epilepsy nurse thinks this is a gimmick and the family would be better off if the money was spent on more play therapists for children with complex needs. The old lady on the top right has early dementia. Her relatives hope that she'll accept a GPS armband so they can track her down if she gets lost when she's out walking. But her social worker is concerned about the ethics of what she calls granny tagging. The man consulting with his doctor in bottom left, um, he's consulting by video, he has abdominal pain. The doctor's worried that instructing her patient to poke here and poke there, um, rather than being able to do that herself, uh, could miss an acute appendicitis. The lady trying to monitor her own blood pressure at home feels lonely and confused. She just wants to go and see the nice nurse at the GP surgery, like she did before the pandemic. In each of these examples, we've used structuration theory to look at the dynamically evolving roles of patients and professionals as new technologies both inscribe social structures and create opportunities for structuring. So let me sum up. In this lecture, I've given you a personal narrative of my time at Clare. I've explained how a serendipitous year of SPS broadened my intellectual horizons and transformed my future career. If you're a medic with a more is better view of medical technologies, I hope I've taken you a little way out of your comfort zone. I've encouraged you to reject deterministic technology as superhero discourses which depict particular new technologies as invariably causing particular benefits for patients or clinicians or the health service in a politically and morally neutral way and as evaluable purely by technology on versus technology off randomised controlled trials. I've introduced some critical perspectives informed by philosophy and the social sciences, which look at technologies as part of complex socio-technical systems. But while I've invited you to be skeptical about modernist promises about technologies, I've also encouraged you to reject the Luddite cold technology versus warm care dualism, which depicts an inevitable trade-off between good care and technological progress, making us set in our ways and fearful of innovation. I want to, before I finish, acknowledge my research team, the Interdisciplinary Research in Health Sciences Group at the University of Oxford. As you can see, I've spent my professional career creating a space where researchers from diverse backgrounds can come together and think creatively about research questions that have a bearing on human health and welfare. There are one or two doctors on my team, but they're outnumbered by social scientists and other non-medics. They're a fantastic team. I owe them a great deal. The undergraduates among you, we do have summer internships, so speak to me afterwards if you fancy a spell at the other place. So I want to finish by thanking Loretta again for inviting me to Clare College for hosting this series and also for the formative education that transformed my entire life. And I also want to thank the many funders of my current research programme, uh, whose logos are shown here. So thank you very much for listening.